Welcome to another episode of Threads in, of Enlightenment. It is my pleasure always to welcome our guests. And I, with humbleness, I welcome uh, Carolyn. And I know that every person that comes here entrusts to us their story that we would then take this story and learn from their journey so that you and I can become the best human spirits while we're here on this earth. And with all of the wisdom that she has, I'm going to be trying to pull it all out of her so that she can guide us to the next space that we need to be. Carolyn, welcome to Threads of Enlightenment. Oh, thank you so much, Ken, for having me this morning. This is great. Excited to be here. Talk to us, girl. Tell me. Tell everybody about all this wonderful stuff that you have created. I've been reading a bunch about you. Let them have it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm a psychotherapist. I'm an intuitive and I'm an energy healer. And I've been doing that for 25 years. And I incorporate mind, which is therapy, body, which is um, Reiki and healing and spirit, which is being intuitive. And I'm from, um, I was born in Brooklyn and then I was raised in Connecticut um, I spent uh, 20 years in LA, but I also spent some time in New York City, going to Columbia, getting my master's in social work, um, working on Wall Street as a therapist. Um, but I'm back home in Connecticut. Um, I decided to come home during the pandemic and reestablish myself here, um, coming back to my family. And I opened up a meditation center. So I do teach meditation too. I really want to help people to find their soul, their essence, why they're really here on this planet. And not to just live a life haphazardly, but to live a life intentionally and to know that you can co-create with the universe to create what you are really here for, uh, to do. So um, my meditation center is called Conscious Creations, and it's in Bloomfield, California, uh, Connecticut. Um, and I also do energy healing. I teach about Reiki and healing, um, help people do connect to their higher selves um, help them find, you know, the highest purpose and to get through the difficulties with relationships, with health, with trauma, with difficulty, with um, sadness, um, with purposelessness and to find their true qualities. So I've written two books, uh, Honor Your Spirit and uh, Soul Wisdom, which is a compilation of my newsletters. But I also have a workbook called How to Work with the Universe, which is kind of my tag. It's how do people connect to universal wisdom um, that the universe is constantly speaking to us every day, every minute by um, setting a sign, symbols, synchronicities uh, through numbers, through songs, through messages, through totem animals. And if we become an active participant and being mindfulness, mindful in our lives, uh, that's why mindfulness is such a great type of meditation, that we can start co-creating with the universe, co-creating a a better existence, one of abundance, one of truth, one of healing, and one of joy. You know, so that's me in a nutshell. I want to thank you for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. This is the end of the show. Um, I think she said it all. We're done. We're out. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, that is beautiful stuff. I love everything that you said, Karen, everything, because this is what Threads of Enlightenment is all about as well, is to uh, bring the stories, the people, uh, the collective wisdom uh, uh, that uh, is out there through people's lives and experience and challenges and victories. We celebrate the triumph of human spirit at this podcast because it is the, one of the most powerful force on this planet. Once we are recognized uh, who we are, we learn how to love ourselves and we learn how to love people and do all these co-creating, as you mentioned. Um, you talk about some of the things that I always talk about, uh, how we are greater than the sum of all of the input that people tries to put into us. But life has a way of trying to reach us. And as you mentioned, uh, we'll come through numbers and songs and all of these different things. It's, constantly trying to get our attention and because we do not live in a state of awareness um we kind of uh it, it'll ha what'll happen in most cases is that we crash and burn carolyn and then at that point is when we kind of got get our head together and say okay um something um i've been trying to something is trying to get my attention 
And so we deal with that. Mm -hmm. But I want to take you back a little because we do this at Threads of Enlightenment. We want to go back into your family structure. Um, I know a lot of people call it home. I call it the lab mm -hmm. that um, we have these scientists working with formulas that were given to them from this book. And so they're looking at us with no really um, plan and they're uh, creating wonderful things in us. Talk to me about your home, your family unit, stuff like that, as to what type of um, childhood did you have? Okay, yeah. I grew up um, in Connecticut, and um, my parents moved from Brooklyn to come to Connecticut. Uh, my father was a, a, a minister, and then he became, um, and he also was a social worker, so I'm a social worker too. Mm. So that was a spiritual. Uh, my father was an Episcopal minister, and he eventually became the first black bishop of Connecticut. Wow. And Connecticut is the first province. Yeah. And he's the third black bishop in the United States. Wow. Um, so that was a big thing. And everything that he did was through spirit, through yeah. understanding. You know, um, my father and my mother are immigrants. Um, they both came here from Guyana. And um, my mother um, was also... Uh, very instrumental in what I was doing too, because she was a teacher, a chemistry teacher. Uh, she went to Columbia, so she was the one that encouraged me to go to Columbia. Um, she was a teacher, but she also had scholarship funds. And her birth, her best, her big thing was to help, you know, women and Black women to understand science and math, and you know, know that science is not something that women can't do or <laughs> black people can't do. And she did that with, um, she won an award from Williams College called Teacher of the Year because mm -hmm. she sent a lot of black and Latino people to medical school to help them wow. to, in teaching about chemistry. Yeah. So, um, so my mother was a scientist, but she also had a lot of experiences where um, she would actually like uh, see her ancestors who had passed on she got messages from spirit. Mm -hmm. She was in Guyana. She said when she was little and um, this Indian man uh, came up to her and said, you're going to go far away and you're going to just stop her and like walking to school and you're going to, you know, inspire a lot of people and do great things. Don't be afraid when it comes up. And she's like, wow. And she was with my grandmother. She turned around to look for my grandmother and say, look at this man. Turned around. That man was gone, gone mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and she knew it was a spirit that had come to her that gave her that message. Wow. So, um, yeah. So my mother always talked about how she really wanted to get a scholarship to come to the United States. Um, so she used to pray and pray and read the Bible. And um, at one point, she said the Bible, the words changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was able to astral project. She was able to leave her body and go different places. So they had a big exam. If, you, if you're a number one person to get this exam, you were able to come to America and get a free um, college degree. Mm -hmm. So she said one night that she was studying and studying and her body just left. And she went to the exam room and opened the, um, the file cabinet, mm -hmm. got the exam <laughs> out. And then she looked at the exam and um, she got the question. She went back home, got back in her body, woke up in the middle of the night and started studying and she got number one. So she ended up getting a free scholarship to Hunter College wow. and then she went to, on to Columbia. Yeah. So I heard a lot about these stories growing up about people coming, give you messages, disappearing, using spirit, you know. And then um, since she was a scientist, I was very much into metaphysics, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the physical. What is what is that manifestation of working with the mysteries and the mysticism of the universal knowledge? You know, my parents came. They're very poor, but they said they trusted spirit. And then my mother at one point had a dream and she said um, to my father, he was in uh, Bridgeport in one of the poorest cities, one of the, um, in terms of like churches, one of the poorest churches and Connecticut is very wealthy, very old money, very waspy. So all the other churches, um, you know, had a lot of money mm -hmm. and my father, my mother said, you're going to be the bishop. And she goes, I had a dream that you're going to be the bishop. He goes like, no way. <laughs> he goes, yeah, yeah, you are. I had a dream. You should run. So she goes, someone's going to come and don't, you know, put it, you know, push it away. So, so she heard a knock on the door, like a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, Bishop Coldish, we're so inspired by your spiritual story, your experiences and everything else. We want you to run as Bishop. And, you know, he's very bright. My father's a PhD from Andover Newton. He went to Howard. He went to UConn for social work. So um, he said, okay, <laughs> just like my wife said, so he ran and became the third in the country, wow. you know? So I heard these magical stories growing up all the time. 
And I knew that, um, you know, I did not know, but at, at later in my life, I realized, oh, I was being set up by my parental background, mm-hmm. you know, scientist, a teacher. Yep. So I teach, you know, metaphysics and then a social worker, a counselor and a minister spiritually. Yeah. So it was almost like when people say you pick your parents, I could see that. Yeah. So I, you know, I grew up, I went to private school and um, I went to Wesleyan, then uh, Columbia. I won a lot of awards mm-hmm. as a runner and then I won awards as a um, a chemistry award or you no, know, it was, I did a, a science project and a writing award. Um, I was supposed to be skipped, but I, uh, my mother didn't want me to skip. She didn't want me and my sister in the same mm-hmm. class. But um, so it was a lot of education was really important in our family, doing well for other people, like helping other people, yeah. um, you know, you know, doing a lot of different like charity work and different things. But I grew up pretty, pretty happy. The diff- most difficult thing that I, I think I dealt with was a lot of racism yeah. because, you know, we were in Connecticut, we moved to a suburb in Connecticut. Yeah, mm-hmm. later. So I remember like um, coming from a private school, I went to a different eighth grade and I had to write uh, a uh, story. Uh, They gave us a quote. I don't remember what it was, but we had to write a story behind it. And I did that. And out of 300 kids, the principal picked mine as the best, you know, essay. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited. She was, we're going to do the graduation speech. And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is great. And then when I went back to my classroom and I was, there's only two of us, two black people in the number, like the level one classroom. Yeah. And uh, by the way, my mother had to push us to get into level one, me to get into level one, even though I had an A average from a private school. Mm-hmm. It was a public school. So the, the teacher said, well, you're, you know, like, oh, I don't think you deserve to win in front of all those white students. I was so happy and I was crushed. Yeah. I was like, well, why? You know, and she's just like, well, you don't deserve, you're not the type of person to do a speech. So I went back to tell my parents. My mother was not afraid to mince words. Mm-hmm. She went to the principal and yelled <laughs> <laughs> and the, the principal said, well, I picked her. How dare she say that? But I was already so embarrassed. Yeah. So, and it was like a lot of smart shaming. You know, why are you so smart? Why did you do this and that? And I wrote, write about that in my book because it was just like people just, you know, profiled me. And my parents always taught me, well, mostly my mother. She goes, you're smarter. You're smarter than anyone. You're smarter than them. You're smart, you know? So um, she'd always like say that to me over and over again. And so then I ended up doing the graduation speech. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, it was a school where most of the black kids were bust. So I lived in that neighborhood. So I wasn't bust in. These black women were taking my picture. They're like, I never (laughs) think I see a black person do the graduation eighth grade speech. And I did it with my little Afro. So (laughs) that was a lot of my background. Uh, That's funny. I know your parents being Guyanese. um, uh, I am Guyanese and my parents from Guyana. My dad was a full-time teacher at the age of 12. Mm. And so our um, household was all about education, education. When we never stopped going to school, when we went to school, uh, when we got home, the school home was more intense than the school that we went to. And so my sister and I, I was in my second year in college at 12 years old. My sister was 11. She was in the first. Um, and so I know about uh, that uh, strength that is within the family when it comes to that. And also from my culture, when I came to America, I, because of all my uh, people in power in my country were black, I never really had an identity um, uh, problem as to say. Because I, I, that's all I knew was powerful black people. So um, mm-hmm. uh, some of the, the challenges that I encounter in, as a young man in school, they put me in, in junior high school, so I almost lost my mind. But some of the challenges that I encounter was based on the fact of um, uh, the strong personality that uh, your parents would have tr- just put inside of you being from that culture because we were from there and my dad and my mom had that strong personality that they just um, implanted into every single one of us. And um, uh, yeah, I could attest to some of those things that made you who you are because they were also in my household as as a young man um, coming up. So you have uh, gone through, you've gained all of this accolade as a young lady. You're moving in now. And you are uh, going to school. Uh, you got your, you said you, you're a therapist. Uh, you did your social service work. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And then you started uh, uh, your therapist. Now, how did, um, as a social worker, because I know I work in that, uh, I worked in, in healthcare and I've seen some of the challenges that social worker workers have. How did um, some of those, um, uh, uh, I want to say, encounters began to help mold you as an individual? Mm, yeah. So um, I think that what happened is as I was studying at Columbia uh, to be a social worker, um, I started to see ghosts out of the blue because all those experiences my mother talked about were her experiences, yeah. but I was open to them, but I never knew it was going to happen to me. So it's just ghosts would just show up. My grandfather showed up um, and my grandfather was a fisherman and I saw this man with these big boots. I didn't even know him. And, um, uh, and then I knew who it was. So I was like, why am I seeing ghosts? So I started to get into spirituality mm -hmm. And, you know, this woman said, you need to meditate more and, and do different things to clear this energy. So you're just working with it. And then I learned that I had to work with the universe. So as I started opening up spiritually, when I was working with my clients, I started to see their auras. Yes. And I was like, why am I seeing their auras? And I was working with developmentally delayed people down on 7th Avenue um, in the fashion district um, locational, but they had the brightest auras. Like they had purple and little mm -hmm. gold and I would see their guides. And I realized that sometimes when people are in um, disabled bodies or in challenging bodies, it's because they're older souls yeah. that an old, and I started learning about the soul, a powerful soul will have, um, you know, maybe challenges that they come in with because those are obstacles to overcome. And then God knew that they were um, higher beings. Yeah. So I would give them messages just like talking to them and I realized, wow, these are these are older souls like trapped in these bodies. And one girl I worked with, Amanda, she was as a pseudonym, but she was a young African American girl who was in developmentally delayed, allegedly, but she would always be reading books. Mm -hmm. And she read about nine books in a week. Wow. I said, How can you be developmentally delayed? She was well, I was in foster care and no one told me. And she had this you know, how to like, you know, how to work with go to the right classes and I was pressed. So they basically just pushed her into lower class, but she had this beautiful purple aura. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you know, Carolyn, um, you know, we're, this is not our home. Our home is in heaven. And that's where we learn about the truth and the light. And I was like, who is this little girl <laughs> talking to me? So what's interesting about that. So I went, and then I would speak to her about things like that. And she got stronger and stronger. And, you know, and I, I, I said, this was a powerful soul in a developmentally delayed body. So then later, years later, when I was trying to leave my job um, as being a social worker, I went to, you know, got my master's and was working on, um, I was, I was like, I, I worked with a woman who was very difficult and she wanted to like try to get rid of me. It was really sad um, because she was jealous of my light and how good I was doing with her, her clients. It was her clinic. Yeah. And she was going to push me out and I was thinking of leaving. And I was like, well, should I leave? You know, what should I do? And I was walking down the street, maybe three years after I met Amanda and in the middle of, in Brooklyn, randomly, there's Amanda. And she's like, Carolyn, Miss Carolyn, Miss Carolyn. I'm like, oh my gosh, Amanda, how are you? She runs over, gives me a hug and said, guess what? And she's again, development, the delay. She goes, I'm, I finished my BA and I'm going to be a social worker in social work because of you. Wow. And I was like, what? I was just thinking about leaving um, the career. She goes, what? She looked stunned. And she's like, you can't do that. You changed my life. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. And I looked at her stunned. And then I realized that, and then she goes, well, thank you. She gave me a hug, got on the D train and she was gone. Wow. And I was like, she truly was an angel. So people will come to us, you know, and, and you, do, you can't judge. This is why in the Bible says you can't judge, but you can't judge people. Can't judge. You don't know who that soul really yeah. is. Yeah. You can't at all. Cause so that's an I, I also, Carolyn, I, I, there's a period in my life where I saw people's aura. I could tell who they were. Hmm. and uh the colors and so forth and um uh, there was a point in my life where i also would um because uh, i was open to the spiritual realm as well where i knew people's thoughts and their life i would be walking by and all of their life information um depending on the individual that uh, uh i was needed to speak to all of their information would be coming and downloading me and I'd be standing there walking by them, you know, and, and then all the, the information would download and then I would stop them and, and engage in the conversation. And they'd be looking at me, want to know where am I getting all this information from? 
but um, I remember <laughs> walking wow. by. I was uh, in corporate America in my suit on. I, w- I was in a hotel for some some uh, event, and I'm walking by this gentleman, and um, I saw what he was he was planning on committing suicide. And mm. I remember walking by, and I grabbed him, and I said, "Let's chat." And um, we began to discuss uh, his life. I began to explain what I was what information was coming and we had a conversation um about the decisions that he needed to make and so forth so yeah i I know of some of that type my mom my grandmother um she was the shaman in in the village in guiana everyone came to her uh for treatment my mom was a part of that because my mom assisted her being her mother so yeah in in the culture um we are uh, familiar with things of the spirit realm. I can tell of stuff that would scare people. When I came to America and I saw how lightly they um, they took the spirit realm and things were they were doing, because in my culture, if if some certain women say to you, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, you know. Hmm. So I've seen some stuff that I've never ever talked about. Um, because, uh, you know, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but, uh, the spiritual realm is a real thing. It's, um, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, people need to be aware and be respectful of it. Uh, uh, but also it's a great place to, to learn. And, and you had the perfect opportunity. You had your, your dad, your mom, the science part of it, the spiritual aspect of it, the encounter with with um, different entities and so forth, which um, helped in your shaping your your mental uh, and spiritual uh, uh, being. So here you had this encounter with this young woman at that specific time. Did you leave? Did you, how did that um, change your decision and how did it progress in your life? Yes. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I wrote about Amanda in the book because it was so powerful um, is that I was going to leave the career. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not making a lot of money as a social worker. This woman's like kind of <laughs> harassing me because she's jealous. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here at the right time, at the right place, three years later, Amanda would come and give me a message. You changed my life. And then she said, you, you know, you like, you kind of helped heal my soul. Mm -hmm. And I was like, soul, you know, like kind of what's a soul. So I realized the universe was speaking to me through her, that she was an earth angel and that what are the chances in in large Manhattan that, you know, in in Brooklyn, we saw Mm -hmm. each other. So I knew that there was a, there was, I was being guided. And after seeing ghosts, I always started asking the universe for messages. Um, And then we are going back. I just want to go back to what you said about family origin. My grandmother on my mother's side um, um, was also, she had a fourth grade education, but she used to speak to the angels. And one time she got lost in Guyana or left. And and then she went somewhere. They didn't know where my grandfather was going crazy. They didn't know where she was. When she came back, my mother said she was speaking this foreign language. Mm. And it was almost like a language that didn't understand. We would know it now as the language of the angels. Yeah. And she said she went underneath the earth and um, into the water and was speaking to dolphins and other stuff. And my mother said, it was crazy. Da, da, da. I said, wait, where did she go? She says, I don't know. It was just, it was just crazy. And then they always wanted to hospitalize her. Wow. And then um, she was like, well, I, and then my mother described it more. I said, was it called Atlantis? She was, that's the place she said. She went, yeah, Atlantis. My mother had never heard about Atlantis. <laughs> And and before my grandmother died, she told me she was in the fifth dimension. Wow. She had a fourth grade education. How do you talk about dimensions? So that and my grandmother was blinded at sixteen when she was running. And these are the stories I heard about magic and spirit. And um, when she was running, somebody they she fell and somebody's cleat hit her eye. She was blinded, and she was you know very distressed. She said months later she prayed to God like I want to see this huge light came into the room. And it uh, gave her back partial sight. So she was able to see a little bit, not completely, mm-hmm. but enough that she could be able to get around. And that was a spontaneous healing. So that was powerful. And then my other grandmother, my father's side, used to do readings. It wasn't until I appeared on CNN years later when I worked at UCLA as a healer that my father watched it. And he goes, oh, your grandmother used to do that, his <laughs> mother. So she would do readings in her kitchen table with 16 kids, you know, wow. um, and to people in Guyana, it was like she was kind of well known, my father said. 
And I said, other people do? He goes, yeah, there's like five or six. He goes, he goes, and I said, does she charge money? He goes, no, 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 no. We don't charge money for stuff. They like never that did. There. They, we, they never did. Back no. There. It's, yeah. Yeah, and and he, they had the same kind of um, like self esteem and understanding. When I dealt with racism yeah. here, my mother didn't know what I was talking about, and so she experienced it when she came yep. here. But they were they were the high people. The black people were the ones that had the were the lawyers and the bankers mm-hmm. and you know the teachers and the, you know. So it was shocking when people would question their intelligence. Yep. It was just like, who are you? So my mother would struggle when I went through. That's why she'd always say, well, you're intelligent. You're smarter than them. Da, 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 da. So, um, yeah, but I, I understood now that the universe was constantly speaking to me. And that also some of the work we do is our ancestors work to continue it and to help people on a better path. Yeah. So um, another thing that happened a lot when I was in at Columbia is when I was getting distressed. I mean, here I am, one of the top schools. Um, getting social work, but I did it in 16 months. I did an accelerated program, got an A average, and I also was work was working at different, you know, clinic, like we have to do practicums. And I was like, get so distressed. And every time I got distressed, I'd look around and I would see a blind person in New York City with a cane walking around. I saw about 20 blind people. Mm-hmm. And I realized that how can I be, you know, complaining about my existence and you know where I'm really kind of quote unquote privileged in many ways and I see a blind person I said ah walk by faith and not by sight so the universe was teaching me to trust to trust that you don't know how this path is going to go like imagine you know Columbia is one of the oldest social work schools most conservative and here I am seeing ghosts (laughs) and I'm seeing visions and I should be labeled psychotic (laughs) but I was really understand psychic means of the soul and psyche means of the mind so I was combining both yeah, they, they um, some of the things you were talking about where your um, family were um, able to travel uh, through time and, and uh, uh, shift from place to place. You read those things in, in the book of Psalms. People don't know that they mm-hmm. talk about some of those things. Philip, um, he was uh, one of the disciples in Jesus' time. Uh, he was preaching to a man, and after he finished preaching to him, he disappeared, went to another area. Mm. So these things happen. It's just um, people are afraid to talk about them in, in, in church. Uh, and the Bible says that uh, we have in ter- church, they teach the traditions of men and made the word of God in none effect. So a lot of people are ignorant of the power of the word of God and the power of what truly uh, was being done within the framework in, in the pages of the Bible. So that's another topic. Anyway, Carolyn, <laughs> <laughs> you are now aware of all of the um, spiritual aspects of, of uh, and this is really a great conversation because not many people are privy to some of what the conversation that you're having, uh, that they're not aware of it. It takes them years to find it, but you had a dance with the spiritual realm from a young age and you're maturing as this woman, and you're still within the dance of um, the uh, amongst the spiritual and the natural realm. So you're seeing all of these things now as you begin to move forward, coming to to uh, this uh, present day. How did you? How did the book come about when you're doing all of these things? And um, uh, um, some of the challenges. Okay, let me go back a little. Talk to me about some of those challenges within the race piece of it, because I had to deal with that. Um, uh, parts of me became bitter, angry, and then, you know, you had to let it go because, um, you know. Talk to me about some of that effect on you who, about the racism piece. Yeah, um, yeah, racism is something I actually wrote about it maybe when I was at Wesleyan. I went to Wesleyan. Um, it, and it was something that it was a little foreign to my parents yeah. <laughs> because they grew up with such support, but they understood it. My mother did experience a lot herself mm-hmm. here. And, um, here was a black man being the first black bishop in Connecticut. You know, he was at that position. He was head of Yale divinity school, um, because Yale owns, I mean, the Episcopal church owns the uh, Berkeley school. So he would kind of like to be the CEO in all these prep schools like Pompret and Salisbury and in Connecticut. And these are people with old, old money. Yeah. So, you know, the contrast of me being a young black woman was just and having my parents idea of me being bright and smart 
and intelligent and I can do anything I want. And other people being like, no, you can't. Yeah. For example, being in, I was really good in math and I got, you know, A's. And I remember my teacher saying, I cannot believe, or the, again, the whole classroom was white another time. And maybe I was in junior high, second grade, uh, junior high or 10th grade. And he said, I, you got higher grades than you got the highest score on the tri trigonometry class, um, Sam. And I can't believe you were better than the Asians. Wow. <laughs> and he thought that was a compliment. It was just so insulting, you know. Yeah. And um, that was one. And then I remember uh, they did a little like, um, like, you know, doing like, you know, like a spelling bee in my little English class. It was a huge one. And I got the best one. But that English teacher actually was supportive because the other kids were like, how did she get so well? How did she get so smart? And people would just not talk to me and be really harsh. And the teacher's like, well, she did the best. She got all the class, you know, all the things right. So um, I just, and I remember he wrote a really good recommendation for me to go to Wesleyan. And he was a gay man, a gay English teacher. Mm -hmm. And he was very supportive, you know, and trying to, you know, kind of quote unquote, protect yeah. my intelligence. He said, don't let everyone judge you for who you really are. So, I mean, there was just a lot. Of, I was so many things. I remember going to Wesleyan and, um, I did well in the math class, but it, maybe like one grade, I got a B minus. And he wrote, oh, she didn't um, have the background, the correct education to do well in math. I'm like, what are you talking about? Wow. I used to get A's in trigonometry. And, I mean, just the stereotypes continuously and always fighting. And luckily, my mother was a teacher. And, you know, when I was younger, she'd go in there and yell at people mm -hmm. and say, you know, listen, my daughter has this and that. She had 140 IQ, you know, what are you talking about? You know, and they like, they want to put me in, in, um, uh, level three. And she's like, she, she went to private school. She's going to public school. Why would she be in level three? Yeah. You know, and it was just a constant fight. And I think that really helped my mother's strength. Yeah. Um, nobody could tell my mother, mother didn't know anything. She taught science and chemistry and physics and biology. And there was a question like, why, you know, I would always get A's. She's like, well, why would you get anything less? You know, why would you think that you're, because if people constantly com tell you that you're yep. stupid everywhere I went. I, know, I remember a teacher even tried to um, say I, I was, um, it was, a, I can't remember what class it was, but like, that I, I cheated. Oh, yeah, that's right. They told me that So too. I was in high school. Yeah. 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 And I, I got an A on chemistry. My mother was a chemistry teacher. She had a you know, degree from Columbia chemistry. She worked at Yale as a researcher for a bit when she came to Connecticut and the teachers went to the white boys in my classroom as a junior and said, did she cheat off your papers? How did she get that grade? And I was enraged. So I told my mother, my mother went in there, you know, and screamed at him said, I'm a chemistry teacher too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I taught my daughter how to do formulas and she did not cheat, you know, and, and it was just like, so then my mother wanted me to go to medical school. And after all the trauma with math and science, I said, I'm not going to medical <laughs> school, you know, it, you know, and, um, but it was just interesting. There was constantly, constantly. And that's why I encourage when I, you know, work with, you know, black people, people of color, it's just, it's this distortion of reality is like they truly, there's people that truly believe just because the color of your skin that you're not intelligent. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's, it was an ongoing thing. I write a lot about it in my book because um, you really have to, you know, do schools. And I opened up this meditation center and I'm working with people about, you know, I want to like get a contract with some either schools or uh, women that are struggling with, you know, um, you know, like maybe be on welfare or something like yeah, that to yeah. help them to understand, to meditate, to get quiet, to listen to God, listen to source, listen to that divinity. You're great. Yes. And I'll tell you a story, yeah. Carolyn, that I'm, I'm yes. I was in, um, I, my, uh, I was in healthcare. Um, I was the statewide director of marketing for an HMO at the time. And, um, I had actually helped this HMO. We got their accreditation and we got them approved and all the other different things. And we were a full thread HMO. And I was, I transitioned into, um, network development because we needed to develop this network, a robust network, uh, to provide care for our patients. So I called the physician office and uh, set up an appointment to speak with him to come to see, you know, if I want to put, put him into my network. Um, and, uh, I called him up, 
spoke with him on the phone. I got in my car and we had an appointment to meet. When I walked into the office and the secretary came and got me and brought me back there, both he and the, the sector or the nurse practice. He looked at me and said, wow, you speak very good English for a black man. Oh and I remember looking at him and I couldn't believe what was said at, at because, you know, I'm looking at him and, um, he, you know, you have this staring in your eye because you, you're not sure what you just heard. And I mm -hmm. looked at him and I said, because of your ignorant statement and your, you know, he said, you, don't, you didn't understand who this black man was. I said, I was this black man that was going to make your business, uh, make, mm -hmm. make you wealthy from my business. Because I have patients that I was going to put into your practice. And because of your ignorance, you will not get any single person. I took a practice next mm -hmm. to him and we made that guy. He had to open a second uh, office um, because of mm -hmm. the amount of people that we needed. We needed another physician. I just convinced him to open another practice because I was I made sure that nothing was given to that man. Because if he's going mm. to speak to me that way, how will exactly. he treat my patient? And so mm. I could not mm. trust him uh, to, um, to be a physician based on that statement because he has a preconceived idea already about the color of my skin and some of those patients that I would be sending would have the same color. How would he treat them? How would he treat a young black child that comes with his dad or his mother? So uh, based on that conversation, I made sure that not a single patient was ever given to him because it, it is, you know, my house has nothing to do with who I am, you know? And exactly. I try to tell people yeah. the house if you go into a neighborhood and you see the same house, same color, it is, it is disgusting. It's kind of scary to look at a biz, uh, area like that when you look, you know, you walk into a subdivision and all the homes are the same. It, it, it's terrifying. There is no, um, there is no difference. And uh, but God, in His wisdom, gave us differences. Um, but the house is not. Uh, something that you, because I'm living in this house, uh, I'm stupid, I'm cheating because uh, of, you know, so yeah, it's a challenge. That's why I came back to deal with this particular thing, because it is a challenge within, and it's going to get a little more challenging, I believe, within the society, because we are seeing that progression towards that madness. So um, you started these things. Talk to me about meditation. How did you incorporate meditation in your life because i practice i'm a practitioner of it i know the importance of it in my life so i wanted to get some feedback is in your life as to how did you incorporate that part into your life oh, okay i want you know i want to just comment too of something you said um is that um when i learned more about as a person of color that my um being a black woman actually spiritually is the more challenges you have the more you grow the more you grow yeah. so i realized it was actually a gift mm -hmm. and in many ways from the divine because um the word human man with hue yeah we're the original people you know there's just a lot of power in that and i realized that oh it wasn't something negative it's something to keep me connected to god if you can you yeah. know reframe it so so meditation when i started to um you know, meditate. First of all, I'm an Aries, so I'm always running, 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 <laughs> doing things, and I need to ground my energy. Um, when I started to see spirits and hear messages from the spiritual realm, um, you do meditate. As a, you have to meditate and ground. And when you meditate, you go to the realm of spirit. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, really is like part and parcel of doing a reading or doing um, a healing. I am an energy healer. I'm a Reiki master, and I I love the fact that Reiki, um, and I just appeared in the Reiki magazine uh, this month, this April issue, where I talk about doing distant healing on my father who had COVID at age 91. So um, part of how to do training to be a healer or an intuitive is to meditate, yeah. to quiet your mind so that the divine can come in and speak and my higher self can speak. 
And also it lowers blood pressure. It helps you with um, anxiety and depression. That's why I taught in mental health mm -hmm. for 20 years. Um, it, it's actually the past is can make people depressed if they're constantly thinking about the past, their thoughts going into that energy. Yeah. If they're constantly looking into the future, that fear and nervousness, that's anxiety. And mindfulness brings you back to the present moment. And to me, in the present moment is the presence of the divine. And that's where you get your gifts. The present, like a, giving you a present, is a gift. Your gift is your downloads from the higher realms, from the universe. So meditation, if you're on a spiritual path, it, it must be part of what you do. Uh, so I work a lot with the breath. I work with the heart center, which is part of your spiritual path. Mm -hmm. If you want to be more spiritual, you have to listen to your heart over your mind. Um, but toggling back and forth, I don't, I don't think the mind is bad, but really kind of um, quieting the mind, listening to that still small voice, that inner wisdom that knows your next steps, that knows where you're supposed to go, that is your spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, your spirit is your guiding force. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why I meditate. That is powerful because mm -hmm. I, I, it, that breath, um, Carolyn, I call the breath the bridge between the natural and the supernatural. Um, hmm. It is that quick. And as you uh, practice, uh, you become a practitioner of meditation, it is easier to, to walk over that bridge. I got to a place mm -hmm. that I can be in a space of thousands of people and be in a state of meditation and, and not hearing the noises on the outside. Um, I have learned and have, uh, I am capable of done, doing that. I've done it a hundred times, you know, a thousand times in my life where I'm in a space where it's just crowded and I know that I need to get grounded depending on whatever the, uh, I feel that needs to be and I will able to call myself in and uh, within that space move from there and so it, it's that breath and it's a beautiful thing to feel the uh, transition from one uh, realm to the other being the connection uh, to the spirit realm because that's where all the power resides um, that's where mm -hmm. uh, we see that when Jesus stepped away from all of the madness the noise he came out and he walked on water. Uh, when he walked, uh, when he did miracles, was from his place of, I call it solitude. Um, and, and when I talk about it, it's a it's a meditative state, state of power. Um, and so you you have been dancing with so much stuff, man. You, um, uh, I encourage anyone to get into that class because you're coming from all aspects from this. Uh, spiritual realm, from the meditation, from the scientific point of view, um, you you got a full plate, girl. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, and the word breath means spirit, mm -hmm. so yeah. it, it just makes so much sense. Yeah, and 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 people can become and working in mental health, it was great yeah. to meditate and teach them. I taught mindfulness at a major HMO because it helps people to realize, oh, I'm not a victim of my mental health illness. Yeah. I can be a guiding force in my life. I can, these tragedies are triumphs. These are just the, you know, the different hurdles we need to overcome to find our true calling yeah. to, to turn us back to the light. I agree. So meditation, yeah, is very sacred. It is, the, it is powerful. Simply put, it is power, powerful to the human being, to the human experience. Um, to incorporate uh, meditation into your life. I've seen martial arts do, do it. Athletes do it um, when they're uh, uh, performing. And we see it and we watch it on TV all the time when they're doing. But when you, you go into that space of that athlete, he or she is in a state of meditation. Uh, when they're coming up to that track to run or whatever it is, you see them coming into their zone. And from that place, then they are able to do the things that they do, they just don't walk up and jump around. You know, they put themselves in a state, and from that state, they're able to accomplish much. Um, uh, Carolyn, I want to thank you for coming, President Lightman. I mean, you, my God, you got a lot of stuff, guy, girl, and and I want everyone <laughs> that is listening to this uh, to get in touch with her, purchase her books, and um, 
I always tell people, Carolyn, when they buy your book and they sit down with you, it's like having a private meeting with that author. You are exchanging energy as you curl up in your blanket with the heat on and your cup of coffee or your tea or whatever you're drinking and you're reading, engaged, focused, and there's an exchange that it takes place within the pages. The imagination is enlightened. Um, all of these things are happening. So I always encourage people to get their books, get into classes that they have. You have your meditation piece, get there because it is a place of power. It is a place where you get to know who you are. Be introduced to yourself in that space of meditation because you will see that you are a beautiful, beautiful spirit. Carolyn, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was a wonderful time. Thank you. It was a great experience. Thank you. I'm so glad that you are here and I'm going to point everyone to you because they need to get to your space, man. Um, and uh, so that you can take them to that next place that they need to be that next space so that they can rejoice and become um, a strong human spirits while we occupy this place. Thank you so much. Be safe. Oh, thank you so much. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Everyone who's listening to this podcast, we hope to continually help you to learn how to embrace moments of darkness because it is in the darkness that we learn how to develop and use our abilities to truly see those parts of ourselves often invisible to us in the light. It becomes your responsibility to navigate through all of your trials to find out who you truly are and begin your journey to loving yourself, which is possibly one of the most difficult things you will ever do in your life. To love yourself and to find the real you, but always remember to enjoy the journey. Thank you for coming by. Please subscribe. And if you can support us financially, we deeply appreciate it.